Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to see you all here this morning. Uh, I'm Sharon Pote. I'm here as one of Growth Incorporated's board members. Uh, we have our board president, Ann Gwynn, here, and a fellow board member, Bill Black, here as well. There are several other board members who could not make it today. But um, Growth is really pleased to be sponsoring uh, this presentation by James Mason, uh, who is an engineer. We're actually, uh, we asked him to come up and look at uh, City Hall and at some of the reports that have already been done related to the condition at City Hall and what can be done there um, or whether the city needs to consider a new building. Um, before I introduce James, I wanted to take just a few minutes and talk a little bit about how growth came to be interested in this and how we got to be here. Um, it's been almost a year, May 20th, 2014, that Oliver Backus, who is with Markham Engineering, did a presentation at a city commission meeting. Um, they entitled their report, City Hall Assessment, Renovations, Structural Repairs, and Seismic Upgrades. Uh, Markham Engineering, along with Bacon Farmer Workman and Peck Flannery Grim Warren, had been asked by the city to look more carefully at the City Hall building. Um, as stewards of the building, uh, folks at City Hall knew that there were some things that had been left undone for a while and some fairly major renovations that needed to happen if the building were going to continue to be occupiable and to really serve the community uh, for a few more decades. Um, they asked uh, uh, Bacchus Oliver to come and give this presentation and this is, I wanted to take just a few minutes to set some context before we ask James to come up um, and talk a little bit. This is just a, a brief summary of the presentation that Bacchus Oliver gave um, and the kinds of things that he covered during an hour-long presentation that they gave uh, at City Hall. Um, he did talk a little bit about uh, the concerns that the city has. And there were several things that the city asked them to look at as they were assessing the condition of City Hall. They asked them to um, look at the condition of the canopy and what it would take to replace it, at roof replacement, at security for the building, at seismic evaluations, um, repair of the podium. And that is a sort of technical term. When you walk up the steps of City Hall, that sort of canopy space that's out outside underneath is known as the podium. The ground level is known as the podium. Uh, the parking garage, particularly drainage issues out of the parking garage, and then the mechanical and electrical systems. Uh, Mr. Backus did a, 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 I'm sorry, Mr. Oliver did a really nice job of going through and talking about each of these things really briefly in the spatial analysis. The current city hall has 61,000 square feet. It's 91% in use. Um, so in theory, city hall could function with a little bit less in terms of square footage. Uh, he then went on and talked about a structural analysis. And there were two big components that Bacon Farmer Workman had looked at. One has to do with the canopy and replacement of the canopy. Um, James will be addressing that more a little bit later, but really briefly, it's drooping at the edges. Um, and in their report, they were looking at tearing it off and having to build back a brand new canopy structure on City Hall. And the other piece they were looking at, this building was built early enough that it wasn't built to any seismic code. Those didn't come into place till 71. This building was built in 64. And so how do we really make this city building uh, an essential services building that can stand up uh, to, to an earthquake? Um, and the solution they came up with, which James will be summarizing a little bit later on, uh, is, is a, a classic textbook solution to, to the, the problem of seismic upgrade, but it required removing about 50% of the exterior walls of the existing city hall and putting in new walls to replace those. Um, as I was watching that presentation, I like that city hall building and I like old buildings in general but as I was watching that presentation and I saw the whole canopy has to come off you have to replace 50 percent of the walls I thought is this really worth it or not does it make sense to continue to work with this city hall even though it is an icon even though it is an architectural gem um, if I could have ignored those two structural things and gotten to these their architectural assessment 
um, are some of the basic things you'd expect with a 50 year old building. Uh, the roof is leaking, the windows are inefficient, the doors don't all match, there's paint, there's mismatched handles, there are several small things. There are some big things in there too. Um, and these last two, that mechanical and electrical, they're systems that haven't been upgraded in a long time there, particularly the mechanical. Um, and so there are some, some big dollar needs there at City Hall too. But as I look at these things, and as I thought about these things, there's not a single thing in this that isn't part of any regular building rehabilitation. Um, and none of this worried me at all. It was that previous slide and the structural stuff that was, was worrying. Um, when they came down to costs, uh, and I don't know if you all can read it from here, but hazard mis materials, 100,000, removal for those. Demolition of the canopy and podium would be $2 million. Structural repair uh, and enhancement of, uh, that's the seismic and the canopy, would be $3 million in and of itself. Those architectural things that were listed there, um, come up to 2.5 million. That's repartitioning the offices, putting in new finishes, putting in new decorative motifs, those kinds of things. Mechanical systems would be around 3 million. Because these were such preliminary figures, they put in a 20% contingency at 2 million, giving a hard cost subtotal for renovation of the building at 13 million, and um, expecting all of those soft and indirect expenses, engineering, architecture, other kinds of related expenses at 2.5 for a $15 million price tag. Um, the conceptual schedule they offered, um, it would take uh, several months to plan and prepare and get ready to do the work at City Hall. It would take four to six weeks to do hazardous material removal, another four to six weeks to remove that canopy, which weighs about 15 tons and is, is a, a massive concrete structure, um, 40 to 50 weeks to actually work on the building, and another three to four weeks to get uh, folks back in. Um, that is a year, at least a year, probably 13 or 14 months, that City Hall would have to function somewhere else if we were going to continue to use this building at, at City Hall. Um, by the time I listened to the whole thing, I was thinking, gosh, for $15 million in new constructions, probably comparable, they, they tossed off in a question and answer period some really rough uh, figures um, of $200 a square foot for a 50,000 square foot building costing about $10 million. Demolition and site preparation to, to get a building ready to go on the site would be another half to three quarter of a million. They were looking at close to $11 million. I don't know if that figure included any of those soft costs that were included in, in this figure. But I can imagine what was going through the commissioners' minds as they listened to that presentation because it was kind of going through my mind. We would spend more money to fix this old building. Half of it at the exterior is going to disappear and have to be reconstructed. Why not just build new and start afresh? Um, there are other arguments outside of cost. Um, many folks know who Edward Durrell Stone is. We'll, talk, we'll look a little bit at his work at the very end of this. But um, as Growth Incorporated met last summer as, as a board and talked about really that assessment and, and sort of what looked to be dire straits for the City Hall building, um, we began to ask ourselves, what we realized was that it was those two structural component pieces that looked, made it look so difficult to rehab this building and continue to use this building as City Hall. Um, fortunately, Bill Black had worked with James Mason about 10 years ago. He met him at a conference uh, and then invited him here to do some work at Grace Episcopal's Bell Tower. Um, and James came and sort of got to know Paducah a little bit then. Uh, Growth contacted him. James was willing to come and do a little bit of assessment work on those two structural pieces uh, for us. Um, we went and made an offer to uh, the mayor and city manager right after the beginning of the year to pay for uh, an assessment that Mr. Mason would come and do to see if there might be a different toolkit of solutions for those two big structural issues. And if we could address those two big structural issues in a different, less invasive, more cost efficient way, it might make the rest of the rehabilitation of the structure make more sense.
Um, we have had the pleasure to meet with several of the city commissioners in small meetings yesterday, uh, and we will be at the commission meeting tonight. Uh, Mr. Mason will have a chance to give a brief presentation at the city commission meeting tonight, and we're really glad to uh, have the opportunity to give you all a more thorough description and allow James to talk a little bit more thoroughly about these two um, alternative methods for addressing those structural issues um, that he has identified. Growth has asked him to look at two things, the canopy and at the seismic reinforcement. Um, the canopy has to be done um, if the building is to remain. Seismic upgrade, as that assessment report said a year ago, is up to the city officials. Um, it does not have to be upgraded since it was built before, but we may well determine as a city that we need an emergency command center and or that we want a good safe place to store our city records. So there may be a couple of good reasons for doing that seismic upgrade. Um, I wanted you all to realize though before we got into it that the two pieces that James are going to be addressing are a part of a larger assessment of the City Hall building and what is happening with it. But uh, those of us on Growth's board think that it is the two pieces he's looking at are key in, in understanding and making an evaluation about the future of the building. I would like to introduce to you all James Mason, uh, who has a PhD in geotechnical engineering from Cornell University. Prior to that, he did his uh, master's work in structural engineering at California State University in Sacramento. And prior to that, he has a BS in physics from California, California State University in Hayward. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you all uh, James Mason, and I'm looking forward to us all hearing a little bit more about what he has in mind for seismic upgrade and canopy strengthening at our City Hall building. Thank you. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for inviting me here. It's really fun for me to be able to look at the structure for you, the Paducah City Hall, but it's actually my honor to help you in this cultural preservation that's happening here in Paducah. I wanted to go through and look at alternative methods for the canopy retrofit and the seismic strengthening of this unique structure. In my presentation today, I want to look at these alternatives for the canopy, the seismic strengthening. Uh, I was asked to look a little into geothermal wells. I'll talk about that technology in a short presentation there. And then I will come in to some preliminary cost estimates uh, at the end of the presentation. So here's our building at the corner of the canopy. And it was obvious that there are vertical cracks and horizontal cracks in the canopy. And that should bring alert to people in the community as to why is this happening. Well, in my career, I've learned very clearly that if you can understand the deformation of a structure, you get to understand the structural distress. And that can go from the level of the roof all the way down into foundation systems. So the first thing I do when I look at structures is that I take photographs, critical locations, and then I come back in and I start to draw straight lines around the, the structure itself, whether those be for horizontal surfaces or for vertical surfaces. Remember, when people built these structures, they were built plumb and level. So I'm always looking for those as a gauge of what's happening with the structure. So in this case, what I did was I plotted a line on the edge of the canopy, and I started here, and I pulled the line out as far as I can, and I let it be tangent. I let it touch the edge of the roof as far as I can, and then I start to look for where the structure starts to deviate from this straight line. So again, this is a straight line, and we start to see deviation starting to occur here. You can see the gap starting to increase in this zone. Then I go back and start to look at the distress based on that deformation. And we can see the distress here in terms of these vertical cracks that come down on the outside of the canopy. And then also we'll talk about the horizontal cracks. But for this point in time, let's talk about the vertical cracks. Also in this is that I found that there are some zones that are having what I call rigid body movement, and I delineate those zones, in this case, with this hash line. 
And you'll see that dash line in a couple other photographs, so keep in mind where you're seeing this. As it comes across here on this corner, you'll come over, and on the matching side, there's another vertical crack, and I'll show you that in a minute. So we're seeing this deformation. They've measured this to be in the range of five to eight inches. This is a, a detail from the original drawings, and, and this is what's creating the problem on this structure. What we're looking at here is this is the column that supports the canopy. This is typical as you go around the perimeter of the canopy. The dash lines represent the boundary of the concrete, and, and these straight uh, lines here represent reinforcing steel. Now, and the thing to notice is we do have reinforcing steel that continues across, and then we have some that stops and ends, right here, right here, as we go around. This is the problem that's causing this deformation. This was an error by the original structural engineer. It's just something that's glaring. People have seen this in prior reports and reported on it, and this is causing this problem. Now, interestingly, what we're proposing is to recreate, or actually to create, in the first case, a, a continuity of reinforcement that goes across the column as the alternative for fixing the system, and I'll show you that in a few minutes. But just realize, you'll see this diagram uh, a few more times in, in, in the slides. I've gone in and taken a cross-section of the canopy area. Here we are looking at the canopy. Here's that column that we were just showing. And the deformation, again, begins about at, at the column, and it starts to come out, and it deviates down here. So it's, it's sagging here at these edges. Now, th what's really going to be important is looking at that edge beam, because I think that edge beam structurally is doing some really important work for this structure in its current condition. Now I'm walking over on the other side. Again, I want to show you the deformation. We understand the deformation. We understand the problems. So as I come around, here's this line that comes across. I call this a line of rotation. And here's that vertical crack that's coming right here. I've also projected out these uh, straight lines. And it, again, you can start to see that as you come along here, it's starting to rotate downward. So I'm seeing what I, we call rigid body rotation of the corners of the canopies as a unit. This unit's starting to rotate. It's hinging about these bottom lines, and I'll explain that in another detailed slide in just a minute. The other part that's important here are these compression spalls. Now the compression spalls are created because in the hinging action of that corner, as it rotates down, it's putting the bottom part of the beam into compression. When it puts it into compression, it's pushing against the concrete, and it's beginning at that line of rotation. That line of rotation comes right through here. So that compression spall is right there in the bottom of that. It's architectural. It's not a structural uh, failure, and it's not a failure at all. It's just a spall that's com coming off in, in the system due to the rotation. Now here I come over and show you this edge beam. And I think that this edge beam is actually what's providing the stability to those canopy corners and holding those corner pieces in place. So what we see here in section, let's start over here. Here's the roof deck. It's four inches thick. It comes across. And here's this, this edge beam, a fascia beam as on the edge. And this is the outside face. So it's three feet deep comes down, comes around. You've got, now what's important is that I'm showing that there's continuous steel. So remember, in the structural part, for the steel over the column, it's discontinuous, right? And what we're trying to understand is where are the stresses going in the structure to create this continuity that's holding this system up? And I believe that it's this edge beam that's holding this up. This wraps around the corner, so the hinging starts down here, but we've got this number four bar, this means a number four bar, that's a half inch diameter steel reinforcement bar. And then we have four more down here that are providing restraint for that thing from falling off. Now, interestingly, in the detail of the structure, uh, in, in the edge beam and in the canopy beams, they cast in 10 inch diameter voids. Must have been 
paper tubes that they put in to cast in to lessen the weight of the structure itself. But they went in and put those in. And over time, I uh, highly suspect that because of this rotation and the cracking, and because the roof is in such poor condition, that water's been able to infiltrate into those void spaces. Now, the horizontal cracks then are uh, caused by that water accumulating in these void spaces and then you'll have ice jacking. This is the thinnest section right here, so that's the greatest amount of stress in those zones and it splits open the, the, the edge beam and you're seeing rust from water that's sitting in these voids. So that explains the horizontal cracks and uh, we're seeing the system. <clears throat> the idea of the general strengthening is to recreate what was originally intended for continuous steel to go across the tops of these columns. So here we are, there are these bays. These are typicals that go all the way around the building. So here's a column. That's this column right here. And then here are the beams that come across. So the idea would be to come in and put in whatever strengthening method, and I'll talk about those. We looked at three strengthening methods to come in and recreate the continuity of those beams for what we called negative moment over the top of the column. We looked at uh, three different systems for recreating that continuity with reinforcement. We looked at a uh, new modern material called carbon fiber reinforcement bars. That's what this means right here, carbon fiber reinforcement bars. That was one system we looked at. We looked at putting steel beams on top of the uh, system, bolting those down. And then we also looked at a system called post-tensioning. So we had high-strength high bars, post-tensioning, and pulling the system back with the post-tensioning and, and restraining any further movement of the system. So we, we looked at all three of those, and we came to the conclusion that it was the post-tensioning system that would be most cost-effective, and I'll show you that in a minute. Here's a section of one of those beams for the roof beam. This is a typical roof beam. It's one foot thick, 12 inches thick, four inch thickness. So essentially in this area, our beam depth is 16 inches and it's three feet wide. Uh, we were looking at putting the carbon fiber here in these zones and gluing it into the concrete. Uh, what we've decided to do is to build on top of the beam a, a reinforced concrete beam on top of that. The other thing I wanted to point out here is that this is a spall. That's that compressional spall that I was pointing out. And you see that it's outside of this reinforcement seal. So this reinforcement steel is the structural section for those beams. So it's just an aesthetic spall that's happening and it's not affecting the performance of, of the beam in, in general. So I've been working with this group out of Baltimore on other projects and it's called the Structural Group. They used to be known as Structural Preservation Systems or SPS. They are the premier uh, concrete restoration company in the country. They've worked on the Washington Monument, the White House, numerous buildings throughout the country. And I've worked with them on other projects. So I, I know their track record, they know my design methodology and we've worked well together. Uh, they, uh, interestingly, just finished a job that's very similar to the Paducah City Hall. Uh, and, and I'm going to go through that as an example. They had an excessive deflection on, on a structure. It was a design and construction error, just as here at the Paducah City Hall. And they had excessive deflection in the reinforced slabs of the roof and they also had excessive deflection in the edge beam. So here we see this canopy structure up above and then we have the roof slab right here. And, and here's a photo of that where here's the edge beam that goes around and they have support columns that go underneath. These support columns are important structurally and I'll show you a detail of that why, why we were able to choose this post-tensioning method was uh, the fact that we did have those columns to work with. So we used a system called upstand post-tension beams, and that's what we're proposing here, is this method right here, and I'll show you details. So on that job, I apologize for the metrics, I'll convert these for you. Uh, the slab thickness is 450 millimeters, that's 18 inches. The slab thickness is 18 inches. We have 16 inches for our system. 
Uh, the cantilever length is 18 feet. We have a cantilever length of 15 feet. And the deflection of 60 millimeters, that's two and a half inches. So, and we have in the range of two to five, and at the corners, eight inches of deflection out at the corners. So we have similar systems, similar conditions. So we can go in and look at the application of this technology. I'll show you that in the, the three photographs that are associated with this here. They have this canopy uh, uh, part coming up here, this pop-up structure. They're hiding all their HVAC behind, behind those walls. That's what's happening there. And then what they did was, let's come down here and look at this uh, photo down here. So here, here's this structure, and the idea is to build these beams into the existing structure and utilize the existing slab as part of the structural element to gain structural depth and integrate this whole thing and pull against it. So what we do is we go in, we look at this slide right here, here's our steel reinforcement bars, and then we do a drill and bond down here where that epoxy is stronger than the concrete. So we, when we drill and bond that, then it integrates the whole thing together as a unit, and then we can go through and do a structural design based on the now new overall depth of the system. Uh, here's a uh, plan view of that. Here we have this roof structure, and here are the beams coming out. What I want you to note are these dots right here. Those are those, those columns that are underneath supporting the slab, and this is the cantilever coming out. So here's the, some details. And here's a section. So this section is drawn through, through the system here. And this is the buildup on top of the original uh, roof deck right here. And these are the columns underneath. So they've uh, put the steel in. They're form, putting up the formwork. And then they come in and cast those new beams on top of the roof. Here's an a engineering drawing of that in, in, in section. So here's the original roof section right here. Here's that edge beam. Here are the columns. And the idea is you build this new beam in here. Now what's interesting about this, this technique is that we have this offset. Note how this is in curvature, and we have this offset. So here's 320 millimeters. At this point, this is at 210. That differential is four inches between those two points. So what happens is with any curved object, when you pull on it, it wants to straighten out into a line. So as we pull on this end, it wants to make this straighten. So that wants to pull up on this end, and necessarily it pushes down right here at that high point. So that compressional, that new compressional load that would be coming into the system gets put into the column. And th that's an important feature. And that's, in a similar uh, sense, that's what we're talking about doing here for the uh, city hall. These are structural detail drawings uh, for the rebar, and here it is in section. Now, they recently did this job uh, of, of Frank Lloyd Wright, and used the same technology. So here we have Stone and Wright coming together again on an interesting uh, case study. But uh, it was st the structural group and the guys that I've been working with that went there and actually stabilized this structure. They uh, have a seven inch drop, right? We have a seven inch drop. They have a seven inch drop at, um, at, at Falling Water. And what they did was they went into the, into the slab area of, of the decking and built these beams that come out they what harped those beams, that's what we call that technique, harping. And they come over here and then they pull at this end. And in fact, they did lift this, but a half inch. And each of those strands required 400,000 pounds force just to get the half inch uh, uh, to move it upward. And then they also came back and stabilized the corner and brought that back up. So these systems are in place and you can now go back out onto the deck at Falling Water. This is the same technology we're talking about using here at Paducah. Uh, a few slides about the uh, roof itself. Uh, here's the lantern. Uh, some people here call this the pyramid. Originally Stone called that the lantern. And what's happening here is 
the roof itself slopes away, but what's important is that this zone right here is the canopy itself. There's a step down of 16 inches from this elevation to this elevation. That's an important detail of the building and we're going to take advantage of that in terms of reconstructing and making the system work. Uh, in the canopy area, they went back in and feathered, they sloped the, the canopy itself with a four inch slope, four inch drop from the outer edge out here and four inches from here to here. This is a swale from the original design to collect water and to bring it into the column drains. So here are the column drains here, here, and here as you go around, and those are four inch column drains. Again, just to show you, here's that edge. I just wanted to bring that up. Here's the edge and the column drains were, you know, in these locations as you go around. Here's a photograph of the roof itself. Here's the drop off as you come through uh, the lantern uh, roof access. Uh, it was noted that there were multiple uh, 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 tears and holes in the roof itself. Um, it was if soft material. I'm certain this structure is fully saturated. And that's what's bringing water into, into, this, into the concrete and causing some of the rusting stains. I, I didn't see extensive uh, evidence of any rust, uh, uh, reinforcement rust jacking or any of that. It, it looks in pretty good shape overall. So it's really just taking care of this roof, getting it back together, and taking care of the cosmetics of the spall areas uh, for the structure itself. Uh, more view of the roof structure. Uh, here's that edge, and then this is the, obviously the outer edge of the canopy. Now, because of the deflection of the canopy, it's deflected between five and eight inches at that outer edge uh, when it was originally designed with a four inch drop. So this corner actually is lower than the, the swale, so we've got ponding of water over on the side and then everything's going to be draining that direction. Then you have the added uh, cracks in the edge beam itself, and the water's getting in, and then it gets into that voided space, and that's what's feeding the ice jacking. So we, we understand the, the progression of issues as we go across uh, with all these different parts of structural and roofing. Now I want to talk about um, uh, the, the seismic component of the building and the retrofit of it. First, I want to mention uh, a FEMA document, FEMA 356, Seismic Rehabilitation of Buildings. This is the commentary component. There's another additional FEMA document that goes with it with some structural details. When I first saw uh, this cross-section of, of the building, I, I, I just said, I think this is going to work for base isolation. And then I went into the FEMA document and they have a, a checklist of items of uh, is it a historic structure? Um, can you do all the work in the basement? Uh, is there a room at the edges for lateral movement? Uh, all the things that they were highlighting in the FEMA document, Paducah fit to a T, 100%. It is a prime candidate for this methodology. Now here's how this uh, base isolation works. We have to remember that during earthquakes, it's the earthquake ground motion that comes up through the ground and then it activates the building. And then the building then can get in motion with the ground. There's an important component of earthquake ground motion and seismicity where you can have what's called resonance between the ground motion and the inherent dynamic period and relative motion of the building, that can happen. This, this area is close to that in terms of resonance. And the idea of base isolation is to decouple the ground motion from the building itself. You create it so that they're two separate entities. In other words, you're actually floating the structure on top of these base isolators, these structural elements, so that the ground motion moves underneath the building and the building just moves back and forth as a unit and it moves monolithically. The idea is here, we're looking at this in section, so here's the basement as you come across for the whole building and we would go through and literally cut all the columns and 
the edge uh, uh, walls that go around the complete perimeter of the building, cut those and put those on base isolation and then have these uh, corbel beams over here that have Teflon uh, uh, separators and take that load in that direction. I'll show you some of the other details. Now, the, the interesting thing to note here is that all of the work for this seismic retrofit would occur in the basement, all of it. There's no work above ground. It, you, won't, you won't see any of it up here at all. That's a, a really important feature. Now, so we can get in comparison and understand the differences between these two methodologies. I bring up the BFW seismic uh, 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 and canopy replacement. What they're proposing is to build what are called shear walls, shear panels, reinforced concrete panels, that would be at all four corners, and they would start at the roof line and go all the way down through the podium deck, all the way down, and then they'd have these big shear walls that they'd have to build down here, and an associated new foundation all the way along. So the building would be opened, half of its uh, exposed area, this, the, the skin of the building would be opened, so it'd be open to, to all the moisture content issues, and, and people would have to leave during the construction of, of the uh, strengthening. Now, in all fairness, uh, this is, I've used this very method on bridges. When I would go in and retrofit some bridges, I would use shear panels just like this in between columns for certain bridges. That's because I didn't have these issues that we have here. So I'm very familiar with the technology and uh, it's, it's applicable in many situations. It's that we can do a lot better with this other system and have a better performing uh, system by having base isolation. Now to give you an idea of how this works and, and understand the uh, structure, I want to I work across this slide. I want to start over here. So here we have a three-story reinforced concrete structure. It, it, it's just like we have here at the Paducah City Hall. We have a basement, first floor, second floor, right? You know, it's, the aspect ratio is different, it's wider, but the, the performance is the same. You have ground motion that goes on, and you'll have cracking and spalling as you go all the way up. And as Sharon said earlier, this building was designed pre-1971. It was 1971 code after the San Fernando earthquake in California. That's what tripped all this new seismic design code. And so if, if you have a structure that's pre-71, which, which this is, you could have an extensive amount of damage. What happens is you go in and you put in these lead rubber isolators, and I'll show you pictures of those in a second. But we put in these lead rubber isolators and the ground motion happens this is laterally soft, laterally soft, so that the ground can go underneath and the inertial drag of the building is minimal. So it's, it's just going along. And again, the building moves as a monolithic unitary structure and it moves back and forth. It's hugely important in terms of not only the building, but also all the other internal equipment that's there the bookcases, the desks, the clocks, the chairs, the people. They'll just, they, they don't see the motion and they don't see the force. Uh, this is a, a technical slide in the sense that it, it, what we're showing here is this is called building period. That's a measure of the stiffness of the building versus uh, base shear. That's the lateral force that would be coming into the building. And then we normalize it by the weight of the building is what, what this is showing. The uh, dashed lines are for a non-isolated system and then the solid lines are for I base isolation. Now what happens here is that this building inherently has a period of about 0.4 seconds. It's right in this range, which is pretty darn close in this graph to peak, peak load. Now, our peak base acceleration for Paducah is at about 0.4 to 0.5 G is, is what we're showing. And, and, but you know, there's all these other issues that go into it, but in general. Now, in, with respect to this graph, let's, let's just look at this figure of the graph and then you'll get the idea of what you get out of this. 
So at a period of 0.4 seconds, we would be, if, if this was the appropriate curve for this structure, we would be seeing something about 0.85 G. Now what that means is that if, you, if I was standing here and someone was going to come up and push on me with a force, that force that they'd be pushing on me, pu pushing against me, would be 85% of my body weight. So that would be somewhere in the range of 130 pounds. So if someone came up and punched me with 130 pounds, it'd be pretty hard for me to stand on my feet. Well, that's what this graph is showing, and that's how we normalize it. Now, when you put in the base isolation, what happens is you extend the period of the building. So we were gonna extend the period of the building up to about a second, 1.2 seconds, and you can tweak this. You can engineer that period. That's how you do that through the base isolator. And the point is that when I use this 1.0 curve out here, let's say at 1.2, it drops down to about 0.1. So we've moved from 0.85 to 0.1. We've, we've reduced it 80% uh, easily in terms of the lateral force onto the system. That then allows us to be able to look at this building in terms of survivability. The other part is that the structure is moving as a unit. So you're not getting hard impact forces into the system. So it's just moving back and forth in a slow periodic sway uh, uh, you know, based on as a unit. Here are some lead rubber base isolation. This would be the system that would be used. Uh, what happens here, you have rubber, steel, rubber, steel, and you sandwich these together. You have to go in and design in the expected uh, deformation that you want, and then that'll tell you the thickness. You design typically, if for this lateral deformation, I would say from here to here, that would be half the height. Uh, these are tested to 100% deflection, and they don't delaminate, so they stay together. Uh, they also can uh, survive the earthquake, so you keep using them. They, you, so you're, you'll have multiple seismic events, aftershocks, after the main event, and you get to keep reusing these structures. It doesn't fail, right? It just keeps doing its job. The other part of these is this lead plug. The lead plug is an energy dissipation component so that as it shears, it's taking energy into heat and it, and it just recrystallizes and then they're uh, self-centering. Here is a view of a building that's been retrofit with one of these isolators. They built up this column up to this point. This is the original floor beam and then they insert this lead rubber isolator up in this position. For the Paducah City Hall, we're looking at a section at the podium deck. Here's the podium deck, so this is outside. This is inside, first floor podium deck. And here we have these pan joists. And we come over here and we would install this base isolator here. And we would also bring the columns up to code performance with carbon fiber wrap. And we would wrap all these columns. So there's 64 columns that would get wrapped. And, and I'll show you that detail. But literally, we're gonna cut out this. This will be about 12 inches in height. We'll, we'll do the appropriate grouting, get everything back together. We'll jack the building up around that area to take the load off of the column and then put these in and uh, get this thing working as a unit. Uh, some pictures of what this sort of thing would look like. So here we are down in the maintenance area. Here's the isolator, and then we would do this carbon fiber wrap all the way down. Also, what we would do is cut around each of these uh, columns to go down and expose the existing spread footer. And then our jacking, our shoring system, would start from, from the bottom of the, of the pan joist and go to the top of the footing. And then this carbon fiber wrap would go all the way down to the top of the footing. So it's a unit. And then we would recast the concrete, you know, put in soil, recast the concrete up to that zone, and then seal it with some silicon uh, uh, so nothing gets through. Here are some of these guys. This is some of the structural slides. These are their guys. This is carbon fiber fabric. You uh, go in and you uh, send it through epoxy. We call it pre-impregnating the, the fabric. We get it saturated and then we wrap it around the column and, and uh, it restrains this. Now I, I just want to mention, 
I've, I've been working with this, uh, I, actually I was at the first structural tests of carbon fiber fabric that were ever conducted out in California at UC San Diego. I was working for Caltrans at that time. So I've seen firsthand how this stuff works and I've been using the technology for years and I also use carbon fiber fabric as part of my PhD in terms of retrofitting water systems. So uh, I'm, I'm very familiar with the technology and the strength of the material and it's really a, a great material. Here's a corner view of the basement area. Here are the columns that go around. The yellow dots represent 18 by 18 columns. The blue represent uh, 12 by 12s. Uh, there are, showing five here, this is a quadrant. So there are 20 18 by 18, and there are 44 12 by 12 uh, columns in the structure. Every one of those would get retrofit. Also, this is this wall that extends all the way around in the cellar, and we're gonna cut all the way around and provide a corbel beam to pick up that load and take that load off the wall and provide uh, uh, tiebacks to restrain the earth pressure on, on the wall. I'll show you a detail of that in a minute. So again, here's another area uh, view of how we'd put in the isolator and carbon fiber fabric. Uh, in, in the parking zone, we might substitute, we need to talk with uh, city officials, we might substitute pipe for the confinement. We use uh, steel pipe in California for bridges all the time, and I've designed with that um, quite a few times. That's so that, uh, you know, we all have that problem where we back up into a column now and then in parking areas, and you could bump the carbon fiber fabric. You can, you can patch it, you can patch the carbon fiber fabric, but uh, you can also build in this steel encasement that would do the same job. Uh, here we are in the jail cell. The, this is the top of the jail, just showing you some of the confined space sort of work. The whole jail would have to be uh, demoed and the, the city would gain all that storage space, emergency storage space, it's a huge area. Get, get all that out and, and get over to a new use. The other thing I wanted to show in this slide is the condition of the concrete. The concrete's in great shape. Now, this is going right up to the podium, and we can see evidence of leakage through the podium deck, that's for sure. But the concrete itself is in great shape. You'll get 50 to 100 years out of that concrete structure, no problem. In terms of the walls, these are the perimeter walls right here. I'm back down in the maintenance area. We, this is the uh, break line between the pan joists and the wall itself. And we would cut all the way along here and we would need to install tiebacks uh, to hold that up. I'll show this in section so you see how this works. So here's this decouple line. Here's the, the decking, the podium uh, decking out here. And we would cut that wall right here. Before we cut the wall, we would obviously put in these tieback anchors. So it'll be 48 tieback anchors all the way around, picking up the earth pressure as, as you go around and, and holding it in place. The other thing we were asked to look at that I think is interesting is the air intake HVAC. We've heard that there's been issues in terms of efficiency. So we were going in for one, to look at the confined space work that we would have to do in terms of the isolator, but we also wanted to understand what's happening in terms of the air, in, air intake. So the air intake into this building is on the northeast corner. So they have some louvered sections that have half inch mesh wire behind the louvers, and um, that, that's, that's the filter system for this. That air comes in, and then this is the air intake uh, into the HVAC system is those corrugated panels, those, those punched panels. Um, this is uh, the, uh, over here's the north wall, so we're looking back, and for some reason somebody went in and put in uh, an additional CMU wall, uh, and it didn't work, obviously. They came back and punched a hole in it, but what, what's happening here, let me point out this so you get a better idea. First of all, let's start at the top. So here's the podium deck, Here's the deck framing as you come around. This is the diagonal going out to the corner. And here's the column coming down. Interestingly, they cast a uh, three inch slab 
um, on, on, on grade uh, just as a barrier for this system and uh, it's never been maintained. So here's all this debris field on top of that concrete slab and the air intakes going straight across that and being pumped into the building. So um, leaves question. And then here's looking at some of those louvers with the uh, half inch mesh and that's essentially filled. So they're probably getting maybe 50% 40% air intake of what they're expecting they should be having, and then the machines themselves are very old and need to be replaced. Again, look at the condition of the concrete here. That's in great condition, really. The, the concrete in the building is doing very well. Uh, I was asked to make a few comments about geothermal wells. I've looked into these as a geotechnical engineer, so I do both the geotechnical and the structural. Uh, and I've been looking at this for some of the other clients I've had uh, prior, and, and I wanted to share with you a few of their uh, slides that I've presented to them. Uh, the, I, this is a great place to do geothermal. The city owns that area. You can go out into those lawn areas and drill down, and you drill in these thermal wells, and you put in high-density polyethylene tubing that goes down, cast concrete around it, and then you bring that back up into the structure into a heat pump. And then you have a, a manifold heat exchanger at that point uh, and, and uh, gain from the ground. Now this slide shows what, uh, why heat pumps work. Why do we want to do this? So uh, it's metric, uh, I get it. Um, 15 meters, that's 50 feet. So if you go down 50 feet, you get to a constant temperature in the ground. 10 degrees Celsius is 50 Fahrenheit. 15 degrees Celsius, that's 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So you get down 50 feet, you're at 50 degrees. Now what, what we're taking advantage of here is the differential between the, the earth temperature at 50 feet and the ambient air. Because that's what you're working against when you do your heat, your HVAC system. So if it's winter and you're at, let's just say zero degrees, you've got a 50 degree differential that you already gained from this thermal mass, uh, just bringing that heat into the building and you heat then from 50 to 70. So you've, you've gained from uh, 50 degrees to 20. So you're, you're at a 60 degree plus, 60% plus, right, because you're just doing 20, 20 degree additional load into the system. In a similar sense, you pump down your heat into the ground during uh, summer, and it's that same sort of differential that you're taking advantage of and bringing cold air, cold water, back into the system. Uh, and here, this, this really is a telling slide. This was done by a gentleman out of Switzerland, Brandel, back in 2006. So he's starting to quantify the benefit of doing geothermal. And what you're seeing here is what he calls a primary circuit, a secondary circuit. In other words, this is the geothermal well up to this heat pump, so you have manifolds and all this sort of stuff. And this is your secondary circuit, that's your building. So here's the ground, here's the building. But the important part is looking at this right here. He's picking up three quarters, 75% of his energy for this system's coming from the ground. And, and he's only paying for 25% electricity, as opposed to 100% for electricity. So the investment is huge, doesn't degrade. You get all this benefit out of the system over time. Okay, let's look at some costs on this. Uh, so in terms of the canopy, we would be doing four beams at, at these locations. Uh, one, what we have to do to quantify this kind of work is we do it volumetrically. So we go through and we have 50 lineal feet at each uh, of these intersections. We're gonna build up an eight inch thick by three and a half foot wide beam. And then we will have that post tensioning duct inside. And that gives us uh, 2,800 cubic feet of enlargement around the structure at $200 a cubic foot. That puts us at $560,000. That includes the jacking, all that stuff, you know, that goes with it, right? Uh, the, the, the jacking of the strands. Uh, in addition to this, there's shoring. So we're gonna try to shore and jack. 
So the shoring and jacking would go from the canopy roof, the underside of it, right, all the way down to the podium deck and then continue down into the basement. So there, there's a lot of shoring that has to go on there and that uh, uh, would cost uh, half a million dollars, $500,000. Uh, the spalls that are there are minimal. Uh, there's very little architectural damage to the building and I was figuring somewhere in the range of $10,000 per side around the whole building, which puts us at $40,000. So the canopy strengthening uh, would cost $1.1 million. This does not include any roof work, roof removal, roof, you know, any, no drains, any of that stuff. We're just talking about the structural work on, on the can can canopy itself. In terms of base isolation, there are 40, uh, 64 locations where we would work on that. Uh, each of those costs $15,700. That's to go in, do the shoring, cut the concrete, do the shoring, do the jacking, cut it out, buy the device, put the device in, and then, and then bring it all together. That's uh, uh, 15700 dollars each, so that gets us up to a million dollars. The carbon fiber wrap is $50 a square foot. So we have 44 12 by 12s, we have 20 18 by 18s, and here's the associated cost uh, for those. The, the perimeter wall cost, that includes both the cutting. We have concrete chainsaws now. So we would cut the wall all the way around, uh, it would include shoring, building up this corbel, bringing in these elastomeric separators between the two, casting all of that, making it work together. Uh, 600 lineal feet at $1,250 a lineal foot, that gets us up to $750,000. There would be 48 tiebacks around the building uh, at $6,500 a piece installed, done, permanent anchors. So the base isolation system would be 2.2 million. So that the sum total of all this would be 3.3 million to do the base isolation and canopy strengthening. Now, to give you an idea of comparison here, uh, is uh, we have the BFW method and then we have these alternate methods. So in terms of the canopy, the BFW is at 2.3 million, the canopy over here is 1.1. Uh, the seismic upgrade here, 1.8, 2.2, where we look at a total comparison of 4.1 versus 3.3. Now, the, in, in all fairness, the BFW on the canopy over here includes new roof, and they were estimating that to be about $90,000 uh, for that component. Uh, this, I think, is actually the telling slide. This is an extremely important slide to understand in comparatively the different systems. So we're looking at the canopy seismic upgrade comparison and we're looking at these proposal comparisons. The first question to ask, will the system be, will the building, will the city government be operational in that building during construction? Will it be operational in that building? And during the BFW method, they have to move. And I would easily estimate something in the range of a year plus, right? of them being away. So they're going to have to go rent a facility, move it there, whatever they're going to do, but they're going to have to move it all away for a year. So that's an additional cost in that system. Uh, we're not doing any of that. We're not, we're not getting into the building. We're, everything we're going to do is going to be away from those facilities. So they'll be operational. General safety during construction. I just want to say, first of all, the structural group as a company, as a contractor, has one of the highest records for uh, uh, accident prevention. You know, in other words, they have minimal amount of accidents. Then on top of that, the methodology that we're talking about is a very safe system of going out and doing work, drilling, that cutting, it's very localized. Everything's known how to do that. We jig it and everything's done safely. Now, in question here is uh, on the BFW method, remember they're removing the canopy all the way around the building. So that means they have to park a crane. A crane's gonna have to go all the way around. Someone's gonna have to be up on that, on that roof structure 
cutting it, jacking it, whatever. I don't know how they plan on doing that. Um, that's a dangerous job. If anything drops, it could blow right through the podium deck, right? So there's all these issues about that construction method. So then, um, <clears throat> uh, and then when they get into the walls in the building, you know, they're going to go in and have to tear out those walls. So, you, you know, uh, there's all that work that has to happen. Then there's all the reconstruction. Uh, podium deck survival during construction. It's very questionable uh, with, with all that work going on. We're not touching the podium deck at all. The existing landscape. The existing landscape, they're going to have to have a crane, a large crane, that can boom out quite a ways, that'll track all the way around to lift these large pieces of concrete. That'll tear up the lawn. I hope the trees can survive what they're talking about. It's going to be real tight in those two zones where the trees are. So uh, the existing landscape uh, for that methodology is questionable. Uh, this is uh, something um, that I, I really uh, question is the performance of the canopy during high winds. The, the uh, BFW proposal is uh, saying that they want to build those out of IFAS, which is foam. Steel frame with foam with some light gauge steel stud uh, buildup. Uh, just if you just look at wind uplift loads on the canopy, remember it's a canopy, so you have uplift on the bottom and then you have suction on the top. It becomes an airfoil. So not only do you have a force issue, but then you have the, the aerodynamics of that canopy uh, with high winds. And I question the flutter that would be occurring to that structure. Now the glues of IFAS are pretty strong, uh, that's for sure. Uh, but uh, in terms of this structure in particular, no one's uh, talked about the IFAS and wind loads, dynamic wind loads. The self-weight of the canopy, as it is now, even then adding some more concrete will help uh, that uh, even better uh, under high wind loads. Uh, the building interior will be exposed during construction during the BFW method. It'll be open for months. You'll have degradation of uh, finishes, laminates, all that, paint, uh, moisture intrusion, potential mold on, on uh, sheet rock. There could be a huge amount of problems that come uh, together with that. The costs are comparable. And then, um, and then uh, the funding flexibility uh, the, this method, this alternate method, can be staged. Uh, once you get into what they're talking about, it's, it's, a, it's once you start, you've got to finish it. I mean, that, that's the whole thing. So this could be something where if city people want to stage construction over several years, you could do that. I mean, there are additional costs in terms of remobilizing companies. But, you know, you could say, well, I want to do the canopy this year and the seismic in another year, and then the HVAC, and this and that. You could do that phasing of the work. Um, time? Yes, here's my friend that gets to come back up and help me. Thank you, James. And thank you so much for coming here and for offering what is really, we hoped you would bring a different toolkit of solutions, and, and you did. Um, and I think that previous slide, I mean, to me, this is, this is amazing that I'm sure that the commission, when they looked at some of those questionable things, the, the danger, the expense, the fact that walls would be out, and that would mean that literally every surface inside needed to be redone as part of the rehab, really was creating issues. So thank you for providing this. My pleasure. Um, and I want to take just a minute. Uh, my mother, who is a terrible pack rat, had these down in her basement. Um, I don't know how clearly you can see these, but these are special editions of the Sun Democrat from uh, February 26, 1965. And you see that one headline, New City Hall, a shrine to democracy, many hands busy and long struggle. Through the haze of times comes a magnificent city hall. 50 years after it was constructed, uh, many people have forgotten how proud this city was of 
what was a, a monument to, to modern architecture. It was part of we're flying to the moon, we're becoming one people. It was such a time of hope and our local government at that point went out uh, and didn't just hire a local architect. In fact, it was our local architect, uh, Lee Potter Smith, who said, let's bring in uh, a nationally and internationally known architect, Edward Durrell Stone, to design this building for us so that it, Paducah should stand out. It does stand out. It's a special place to be. Um, this is one of many structures that Edward Durrell Stone uh, designed, the JFK Center for Performing Arts in Washington, D.C. He did a lot of governmental buildings uh, around this country and other places. This is the North Carolina Legislative Building. Um, and for us to have that kind of architecture here in Paducah is a wonderful thing. And for us to be able to think about keeping that building in service and in service to our community for another 50 years is an amazing thing. And I just want to thank James for bringing to us and to the community a couple of ways to think about how we can reuse this building and protect it and do it in a more cost-efficient way. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, everyone.